Good evening, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. It, it's, a, it's a pleasure to welcome you this morning, all of you. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have uh, Mr. Uh, Hans Voboda opening this uh, activity. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Hans Voboda. I'm president of the International Institute for Peace. Uh, one of my thoughts I took over after leaving the European Parliament after 18 years. Uh, during these 18 years, I was very often in Albania and I, I was uh, growing in myself from my love and my positive attitude towards the Western Balkans in general, but specifically, of course, also to Albania. I'm always very happy to be back in. Albania, and specifically, of course, in, in Tirana. Now, um, I want to welcome you together with the other institutes, especially with the Rennes Institute from uh, Austria, and uh, the other institutes are here, local institutes. And I want only to say some a few words about what's the purpose uh, of a debate, or what is the framework of a debate. Uh, Back there, you will still find, if you don't have a copy of uh, the Vision 2030 by the young generations of the New Balkans. The basic idea we had, uh, and with all my experience to speak to politicians and head of states and prime ministers and ministers and parliamentarians, that very often the voice of the younger generation is not heard, is not represented, but it's about their future. In the future of the younger generation who is uh, fighting for change, fighting for uh, economic development, social development, cultural uh, development, for fighting for a new society. Uh, and therefore, it is very, very important to get the younger generation on board and to ask them what they expect, what they want, and therefore, with some other institutes, uh, also from, from Vienna, uh, we thought it would be good to listen to them, to give them the voice, and then bring the voice of the young generation, of course, also to Western Europe, to, Europe, to the uh, European Union, because very often uh, European Union officials and politicians, again, have only the dialogue with uh, top officials or bureaucrats in the countries, but don't really know exactly and recognize what the younger generation feels. One sees emigration, and recently was said, I think, every minute two uh, people from uh, the region emigrate, but one doesn't see all the causes. It's not only jobs, it's the environment, it's the lack of democratic development and so on, and therefore this kind of uh, message, not in the sense of message control, but message which is very often uh, not controlled, but which is very often overseen and overlooked. Now, briefly, what we did, we had several meetings, of the, some of them are here, some of them, of course, couldn't come, meetings um, of these younger generation representatives from all countries of the Western Balkans. <coughs> I want to underline. And we had meetings in countries of the Western Balkans, for example, in Pristina, in Skopje, in Belgrade. Now we are here, but we had also a meeting in Berlin, in The Hague, in Brussels, in Paris. And therefore, and at these places, of course, we sent and we presented, or you, the younger generation, presented the ideas they have also to officials. In, in the office of, of Madame Merkel, in the office of uh, President Macron. We could not yet change their attitude, or the attitude of the French, but we hope that uh, this uh, will be done very soon. One last remark, uh, maybe you will also mention it. Uh, in the days, uh, yesterday and the day before, was presented a new methodology for the enlargement process. Still, one of the elements which is missing is just this kind of participation and involvement of the citizens, especially the younger citizens. And I think this could be also one outcome, maybe also of this debate, 
to tell those who have uh, developed this methodology, don't forget the citizen. And don't forget, especially the younger generation, that they are involved in the whole process. Because what is important is not just to look at the date of opening negotiations, which will come hopefully very soon, but the whole process of development in societies. You cannot wait until membership, if everything goes well anyway, there will be always problems also after membership. But uh, the concerns of the younger generation to get a job, to get a better environment, better health service, uh, social uh, structures, the, the demand is already here now and has to be fulfilled by the national governments, not only with the view of Brussels, but with the view of the own generation. In that sense, I want to stop, uh, because it should be the younger generation who is speaking. And thank you very much for coming, uh, and hopefully we will have a lively debate Please criticize what you don't find uh, correct. They are young, but they are strong enough to also receive and uh, swallow uh, criticism. But uh, maybe also you can transport the ideas of the younger generation and we can find a, a strong alliance in the whole region uh, for changes in the economic and social development and for bringing the country forward to a Europe which is democratic a Europe which is open-minded and a Europe which is thinking about the younger generation. Thank you, and I hand over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Droboda, for uh, bringing this initiative here. And thank you for uh, your work. You have been a friend of, of this region and uh, for Albania during your whole politi long political career and uh, also a friend of uh, civil society. I remember many times that we have met with you and your colleagues from the European Parliament and it was uh, really a pleasure for us to, to discuss together the main issues which our societies are, are going through this very transformative process. And of course that uh, we always need the support of the institutions in, in our work and uh, and this is what we always have uh, had from, uh, from your side and, and your colleagues. Uh, I would also like to, to thank uh, all the panelists I will introduce uh, later, one by one, uh, during the uh, brief presentations, so to have time, uh, more time for discussions together. Um, you will see that there, there will be a different uh, range of issues. Uh, of course, the most problematic problematic ones for, for the Western Balkans, and uh, we'd like to have a, a lively discussion. As you see, the, the panel is 100% uh, 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 girls and women, so it's, it's not, a, <laughs> it's not a, a panel of, of men, which we are, uh, we use to, to see often, and uh, uh, it's it's a pleasure for me to, to moderate this uh, this panel. Also, I would like to, to stress out that the, the time it's uh, it's uh, very appropriate to have this this discussion between uh, because now it's been uh, put on the table new uh, enlargement methodology, which is it has some uh, very positive elements, like, uh, being the more political process. Uh, Meaning to, to have more members, member state voice during the whole negotiation uh, process, so not to alienate them and uh, to have them on board step by step, because we know it, it will be a long, a long one. It's not uh, a short-term project. It's a long term and it's very transformative for our societies and. Uh, uh, there is also uh, mentioned in this new methodology the role of civil society, which is which is good, uh, but uh, still it's not enough, and we have to, to fight for it as as we always do, because it's very important to to for the civil society for us to be there to bring directly the needs and the voice of different. Uh, layers of our society which are not always presented through the 
uh, high-level politicians or from the, the government in, in our uh, countries. Anyway, I don't want to, to uh, take more time because uh, we'll have the, the panelists uh, which would uh, explain uh, the, and present the ideas on different range of, of, of topics and that will allow us to, to jump in if you have comments right after one of, uh, of the presentations, you are welcome. But of course, we will have the discussion session after we have all the, the presentations. Uh, it is my pleasure to give, uh, the, as a first speaker, to Aula Mehmeti. She's coming from Pristina, Kosovo. And uh, her presentation will focus on the Kosovo-Albanian uh, relations. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for being here, everyone. Um, I would like to say that I'm not an expert when it comes to Kosovo and Albania <coughs> relations. However, I live in this region, I work here, and um, this is a youth perspective on how the current situation is. Uh, there is no doubt that the relations between Kosovo and Albania are of a very spe spe special nature because of the historical, cultural, and linguistic ties and context. Uh, the possibility of Kosovo and Albania unification has been part of the political discourse since forever. And according to a recent poll conducted by the Open Society Foundation, 75% uh, of Albanians living in Albania and 64% of Albanians living in Kosovo would uh, vote in favor of uh, the referendum if it would be won. The two countries have excellent relations when it comes to sports and arts. In terms of economic relations, there have been a series of agreements signed by both countries. In terms of political relations, there have been uh, five joint meetings between the two governments, and that is during uh, 2011 and 2018. Whereas in March 2019, the two countries signed an agreement unifying the, and coordinating the foreign policy, including um, joint embassies, which I'm actually looking forward to how it's gonna work. However, there's uh, a lack of implementing in practice when it comes to all of these agreements. At the same time, the politicians have been using, um, have been using those agreements and the fact that they're not being fully implemented uh, to get electoral support in their respective countries, especially the Kosovo side. That being said, the political spectrum in Kosovo, in my opinion, has been quite unfair when it comes to uh, Albania's government. Uh, while almost all party leaders have uh, accused Rama for meeting up with Vucic, we fail to realize that Tachi has been doing so since forever because we have to. If we want reconciliation, if we want to um, move forward, we have to meet, we have to talk, we have to discuss, and we have to sit on the same table and even agree to disagree. That is the need, but we have to sit together. Albania, we could argue, has taken the Balkans' policeman role. Like some people say, it's like you know, it's the United States watching over the world, so is Albania gradually taking the rule over the Balkans. And Kosovo side seemed to support it when Rama said that Kosovo independence is undeniable and that it should be respected in his historic speech in Belgrade in 2014. However, the most important or controversial issues between the two countries now are um, border corrections and the Mini Schengen project. These two issues have sparked a heated debate or actually a series of insults, especially from the Kosovo side. Um, and it was perfect timing to do so, as Kosovo had elections this October uh, in 2019. So political leaders had the opportunity to indulge, indulge themselves in nationalistic uh, rhetoric. The question is what now? There is a heated debate about border correction, but nobody knows what it actually <coughs> means. What does border correction mean? How does the Kosovo side understand it? How does Serbia understand it? And how does Albania understand it? How do people? What do we mean by it? And then the same goes for the mention again, yet it is not clear what it contains. We hear so much uh, talk about the mention again and um, about the possible consequences that it could bring to the region and especially for Kosovo, but we have no clear idea what actually it means, what it's going to contain. So the most important question now is, can we own our truth? What now? The US alone is home to exabytes of information, which is one third of global total world information. 
And then we're com there are companies that store our data. There are, if I'm not mistaken, about six, seven huge companies that store our all world data. And the question is, if the world would come to an end, then uh, those companies would like explode and everything would come out. Would we be able to own our truth? Would politicians be able to face the, the new reality? So this is for now. Thank you. Thank you, Arlo. It, it is uh, good to start uh, with uh, Kosovo Albania relations, and it's interesting developments that have been following this this month, different what uh, we have uh, experienced uh, before, and it's interesting to to, to see this uh, bilateral uh, relations in, in the uh, regional perspective, how it uh, interferes or relates to. to our relations with other neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, and now with, uh, I will pass the floor to, to Ms. Dafina Pecci uh, from uh, RAICO, uh, Pirana, and she will uh, have a presentation on uh, youth and European integration of the Western Balkans, so she will title all the whole region, region as a <coughs> discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Actually, more than a presentation, I would really call it a very simple way, sharing some thoughts and some opinions and leave the floor to the audience to, to, to have an interactive discussion about these topics. Um, when you talk about young people being more interconnected in the region, it's not, uh, it's a, not a new topic. Uh, generations have been working quite a lot uh, since... Uh, since in ex Yugoslavia times and, and after, to make uh, people or humans of these countries get close to each other and understand each other much better because some of them have understood that if we do not see uh, as a benefit the coexistence, then no politician would uh, make us uh, understand this and it cannot be forced. We have to interact, we have to interact in different uh, spheres, in social sphere, in economy, politics, uh, understand how important it is to, to coexist, to respect each other, to understand the differences, um, to be more human, first of all, rather than to label ourselves with our nationalities. And then to see that if this, these abilities, these new abilities, these new skills to coexist, would bring us to a proper integration to that scale that we want to achieve, that European way of living and European values and uh, being uh, stronger and being more prosperous together. So talking about regional cooperation uh, in terms of in, in the youth sector, it started to be more emphasized or to stay highly in the agenda during 2013-2013. 14 uh, through the positive agenda that uh, Slovenia and Croatia negotiated together and then from 2015 during to the Berlin process it was always a certain space given to the civil society. So many other issues were discussed and elaborated when it came, came to regional cooperation but the dedicated chapter was to civil society. It was launched during to the Berlin process uh, in the Berlin summit that it's important to have this uh, youth interconnectivity to make um, to give more more opportunities uh, and a new perspective to the young generation in Western Balkans to get close to each other and therefore there were the first thoughts to design the regional youth cooperation office which later on in Vienna was let's say much more concrete in terms it was still an idea but more concrete and then in Berlin, in Paris summit, it was the declaration signed among uh, six prime ministers to have this office. And later on in Trieste, we had an established office. And then in London, we presented the first result of this office. And what I'm saying that is that this office is functioning and it's very successful. And it's here in Tirana, the headquarters. Uh, hundreds of young people have experienced their first exchanges uh, among them. And I'm mentioning this process just to make you aware or make us all aware that it's about process. It's not about something which can be achieved within a day, within a year or within a decade. And talking about this, I would say that it's not 
um, only important to recognize the importance in high levels, but it's very important to do the homework. If the EU integration itself, it's about supporting our prosperity, it's, it should be us, first of all, that want that kind of prosperity and want that kind of connectivity and want to achieve uh, what we see as a goal. I mean, citizens living in better conditions and being more uh, aware about uh, all the positive things that we do have in this continent and being more aware that only jointly and together we can uh, we can be strong in, in economical terms and, and, and in, in, in strong democratic societies as well. So what I mean to say about this is that we still are facing um, weak democratic systems in our countries. We're still facing a lot of obstacles when it comes to meaningful participation. We still are facing obstacles on having in our activities, in our rhetoric, in our, in our very interesting and important projects, those young people who are not part of the system, who do live in very bad conditions, which are living in rural areas and it's difficult for them to catch us when we are talking about these very important and, and heavy, uh, heavy topics. Um, we, in, when in Western Balkan countries, we are still facing a lot of issues with our educational systems, which are not corresponding to the needs and to the needs of the labor market. We have difficulties by finding the proper jobs. Uh, social security is still an avant-garde issue for us. And having all these heavy issues in our shoulders, we decided that together with, with the partners which facilitated and, and supported us in, 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 the, in this initiative, to create a vision how we would like to see our societies, our countries in 2030. And for us, creating this vision is the most very important uh, step because all the work that we should we are, we will be doing or we are doing is to to meet that expectations to meet that vision and um, we had some very very interesting meetings yesterday and i took some notes uh, from different discussions because it's important to bring young people in the same tables with with the decision makers with people coming from from media from academia it's always important to exchange thoughts and opinions and what we i say what we agree is that uh, being enthusiastic about EU integration, it's not enough. There is a lot more to be done, and that homework, that a lot more should be done in local and in national level. We are uh, facing now um, a very positive attitude of young people towards EU, but if you go more in deep and try to understand what do they perceive with EU integration, how much do they know about uh, responsibilities of an EU citizen, uh, how much do they know about values and how these values are transcripted or translated into deeds, then I think it's, this is another story. So um, due to, to the integration process, there are those chapters which we can't wait to, to open the negotiation process and there are two chapters which are dedicated more to the young people's life, let's say chapter 19 and 26, which do talk about education, employability, social security, culture, and so on. And I think that um, the role of young people on understanding these chapters, contributing uh, to these chapters, and being more close to local and, and, uh, and national institutions should be increased, but should be increased in a very democratic and participatory way. If we are not... Um, if we are not working to change the local context and national context, the regional scale and European scale would look too much uh, utopic to be reached. We have to take the good examples or the inspiration or the models, but everything should be done, let's say, within our, our everyday context. Why these, um, this regional connectivity aspect um, helps us in our, in our everyday work. It helps because first uh, brings a stronger voice in EU level. If you see the, the paper that we have been working and the point eight here is about interconnected region, we have a vision that 
uh, on 2030, we'll have a Balkan Neum, a reg regional office, uh, which will represent the interest of Western Balkans within the EU. Why well, I'm saying that this is a, 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 a dream today, but how the European level uh, sees us, it's about how well we know to communicate our needs, our presence, and our profile. The others know about us what we have been reflected to them. So if we go with a stronger voice, if the young people of, of this uh, region are more connected to each other, uh, are more aware about the positions, are more aware about the opportunities that they do have, and are willing, through a very systematic approach, a very proactive approach, to change the realities, that the message that EU level will receive from us, it's a message that, yeah, really, these societies are very serious when it comes to their integration. And they truly deserve all the support that must be given to be fast and to be concrete uh, during the process. So um, I wouldn't go further on this because I think it's, it's better to have it as a, as a, as a joint conversation. But uh, we should be more critical when it comes to, uh, to the achievements, not in the negative sense, but to see what are our duties now uh, with all these developments. Thank you, Daphina. Thank you, Daphina. It was uh, good to hear uh, uh, the, the proposals of, of uh, young people, young experts, and uh, I think this is the, the added value of, of uh, this vision, that it's uh, the, the young people who are uh, proposing and have their opinions and put it uh, uh, together uh, and asking uh, reactions uh, for it. Because it's, uh, it, it happens many times that it is the politicians who are saying that the future belongs to you, to young people, but it's always in the future, it's not in the present. And uh, I think that's uh, the right approach to, to, to be together, to raise our voice and uh, to look after our priorities, because uh, otherwise it will always remain something in the future which mm -hmm. never materialized in, in, in the present that we are living. Uh, now, uh, let me also mention the, the issue of uh, education, which is very important to not only to young people, but to all of our societies, because it is related to our economic development, our social model also. So now we have uh, uh, Stefan Spirovska from uh, uh, Skopje, uh, with Educational Forum, to have her presentation, her speech on the education reform in, in the region. Thank you, Gladys. Um, hello, everyone, from my side as well. And, and I really agree with what she said about uh, young people being constantly put in a context about being the future while we're kind of always circling that part that, that we're also the, the, the present and that we're mm -hmm. doing plenty of things. That's why two years ago we've started this initiative, like uh, more than 20 people from the region have been part of this throughout the years because um, we're trying to, to build a different perspective for the region to, to show that not only politicians are the ones who are doing important things but also that the young people participate, find their ways and also have their priorities and, and know where we would like to, to see the future of the region. While at the same time, this region treats young people always as a problem. Why am I saying this? Because we never see a structured, um, structured approach towards supporting young people, towards creating policies that are going to enable them to prosper within their own countries. But we're always trying to solve something that is related to young people. That's usually youth unemployment, that's usually uh, brain drain, that's also low quality of education and so on and so forth and we only ring the alarm when we see how bad things have become. Uh, when we talk about who are young people in the region, those are usually in comparison to the European Union where we know strictly that young people are people up to 29 or 30 years old. When we take a look at the structure of the young people in the region, we're usually going up to 35. Why am I saying this? Because young people have more challenges here in comparison to the situation in the European Union. That's one of our main goals that we're trying to in enhance, improve the, 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 the position of young people so that we also fit in that definition of young people up to 29. 
I'm not saying this only because of the age, I'm saying this because of the support and constraints the society creates for young people. So for example, if in the European Union it's easier for you to finish um, primary school, university, actually high school and then university, to move abroad, to provide for yourself, to, to, to get a decent, um, decent employment, to work in your, in your profession, in the, in the Balkans, in our countries, it's a bit more difficult, so there are more steps added in the procedure. So that's why people up to 35 sometimes live with their parents and it's harder for them to provide for themselves and become independent. There are several things that influence this situation, one of which is the education, and I would like to, to talk a little bit more about the um, education and the society in general, then about the expectations of the young people in the region and what do they do how transferred is that in the media and, and how should we reflect that? When we talk about education, um, usually, so the last report of OSCD for uh, Macedonia says that even though students go to school for 12 years, that's uh, primary school and high school, the knowledge they gain equals to almost 7.5 years, which means that we lose uh, four and a half years, do the math, of, of time while being at school instead of um, gaining knowledge and uh, developing oneself. So that's about the quality of education. Then further on, the content we have in the books, it's most of the time not correlating to the time where we live and we should uh, bring about the society. So uh, up until several years ago, we had a program for, for civic education, which was saying that the, the people, the, the citizens, should be humble to the government, should respect what the government says and does, up until there was initiative of several NGOs in cooperation with the Ministry of Education, they, they changed their program in order to build a picture of young people as active citizens and part of the, of the in, entire country. So it's not that they should just sit or, or stand and listen what someone says and thinks, but instead of that to active, actively be involved in, um, in processes of policy creation and raising their voice and being an active citizen, citizen and an engaged person who is further on going to easily provide for oneself. Being unsatisfied with the quality of education, most of the young people decide to leave, leave the region. That's the case in North Macedonia, that's the case in the region because young people have low quality of education but they have a picture of what it should be. Nowadays we have plenty of programs offering um, offering opportunity to visit a European country, to, to maybe participate in a program, an education program there for six months, maybe sometimes a year or two. And instead of being a chance of further developing oneself, that's an eye-opening experience and when young people come back to their countries, they are even more dissatisfied with what they have. And this is one of the things we're, we'll, we're also targeting and it, it is that not only education should be improved, but also the general standards where young people uh, live, function, and, and develop themselves. Because they know about more and they would ask for more, and if that more doesn't come to them, they would just leave the region and, and, and do more in a country that offers more. The, the recent data from the World Bank says that over um, 500,000 people have moved out from Macedonia already which is a serious number, having in mind that we're two million people in general. That's what the last census says. There are things we can do about this. We shouldn't be that pessimistic, otherwise the battle is already lost. But we need to, to target the right problems and to solve them, but also to decompose the problem, not only to, to put a solution as a, as a plaster on it, but to have a constructive solution that will bring about a further improvement of the situation. And therefore, we need to provide young people platforms and, and structures where we can hear them and we can give them what they ask for, not only to do that, those makeup policies that are going to prove something, actually show something or present something, and at the end, not work as we expect. So recently, uh, actually, there is a big role of the media that I wanted to, to mention here. We had an opportunity yesterday to talk with several journalists from Tirana, and I think we all agreed on that, and it's because media is not always in the position, actually the journalists working within the media are not always in the position where they would like to stand. Because it's um, also policy, uh, sorry, politics, politically influenced, there are many things that are creating the, the position where they stand. 
And most of the time, young people are being left out of that media um, space, uh, media sphere, I would say. From time to time, there are very important things that young people do, and they are being missed out and not covered in the media. Recent examples from from, youth, from North Macedonia, youth Macedonia, <laughs> is the the law on youth and youth participation, which was uh, brought this January, and very few media covered that. Uh, on, a, on a real basis, explaining what that would bring for young people, explaining how important that is, and explaining what are the mechanisms that law guarantees for young people in order to participate in the political life. Sorry, the political life. Um, another very important thing that happened several months ago were the first student elections that, hap that happened in a rather democratic atmosphere. And this not only shows that new laws are being brought and implemented, but it also shows that young people have sense of democracy and know how to use their mechanisms. And instead of supporting them and, and telling them how good that is, we're putting it somewhere at the end of the news or not covering it at all and not giving it the, the appreciation it should be given. So my point here is that young people follow the, the politics they are creating their policies and they are participating in processes, but, but they need to be encouraged and this needs to be um, addressed in several levels, one of which is education also. So if we leave young people, if we leave students passing in education more than uh, 12 years and then become part of a university where they can actively participate, we have built persons who are not uh, aware of their uh, of the power of their position and of the power of their role in, within society. That's why the organization where I work um, also tries to, tries to um, <coughs> highlight how important it is to secure student participation within primary school and within high school also to build that culture of democratic participation. I'm not saying that this will solve all of the problems that young people have, but will for sure improve the situation where they stand. So that's why we need to seriously look in the upcoming years in the quality of education and in, in youth participation in order not to disappoint young people even more. This is the last thing that I'm going to say now. Several months ago, we conveyed a research that showed that over 70% of young people expect for the, for the country to become part of the European Union after which we had no from the European Union, and I'm sure that brought a lot about their disappointment. To be even more serious on this point, um, over 90% over of these people who believe that we will, we will become part of the European Union, mainly young people up to, to 35, expect that to happen until or before 2025. We, people who always read and talk about this problem, actually this situation and process, I would say, rather than a problem, know how, uh, how impossible that is to become part of the European Union before 2025. But those are the main reasons why young people stay and, and remain in the region. So we need to think also about their expectations and their strives and their personal beliefs when we build policies and also when we make um, decisions that affect people's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. It's a uh, very important uh, the point that you mentioned uh, regarding the education system, which is uh, crucial for addressing the problem of many young people, young professionals leaving uh, the whole region. And uh, it is a problem that will continue, as we have seen also in other countries, joining you. Even after you join you, there are a lot of people who leave. So it's not the answer uh, just by joining you, but the answer is by creating uh, the conditions here, enabling uh, the youth, the young professionals to express their, their potential. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also to, to include them more in different ways in the decision-making process, being at local or, or national level. So I would like also now to, to pass uh, the word to Anja Jokic, uh, because she's uh, talking exactly about the inclusion of young people in the decision-making process. Uh, the floor is yours, Anja. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, Jess. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anya and I come from Belgrade and today um, I will share my opinion as Dafina said 
on importance of inclusion youth in decision making processes. I will sh share some examples of good uh, practice from my country and region and also kind of um, try to translate it into uh, further regional uh, cooperation. So um, governments usually are concerned with the well-being of youth, but when they are making policies, they rarely um, ask for opinions and positions of young people. And uh, young people rarely are put on the top uh, of the political agenda. And uh, also, almost every single uh, policies, uh, policy uh, made by uh, our governments has direct or indirect uh, influence of young people. But when they are shaped, the, kind of the, the influence of young people is not really taken uh, into consideration how it will um, affect them. Uh, young people are perceived as mere recipients of help, have this uh, patronizing almost a role uh, in our societies and are perceived as a problem rather than a part of a solution to their own problems and their uh, own realities. Uh, young people maybe are deprived of opportunities because they um, adults uh, feel like we lack experience, we lack skills, but I believe young people have their own uh, realities. We have our own uh, ideas and, and interests that um, derive from our own experience, which I believe each generation has. Like, uh, many generations before ours, so so does our. And I think these things should be taken in consideration uh, when uh, policies um, have been uh, developed. Mm -hmm. So um, young people also are um, uh, a strong body. They they are social actors. They have skills. They have experience, which I should I feel it should be uh, embedded in um, all of the policies the policies that our uh, countries uh, come up with. And I believe that young people should be perceived as partners in this process because we do live in democratic societies and even some stronger dem uh, democracies than the ones that are, are present in Western Balkans do not really have uh, democratic relations with the youth uh, of their countries. So some of the, the, the pitfalls to actually this democratic cooperation between um, uh, youth and decision makers, uh, I feel, um, I would say sometimes the, the, the adults have not been empowered themselves when, when they need it, they sometimes are, are suspicious, they feel like they would lose influence if they give the, the floor to young people, but we, I believe we should change this narrative. And as I said, start perceiving young people as partners because Stephanie has mentioned this, we're not future, we are presence and this, these things that are happening are rea our reality. Um, some of the things that um, I would mention that have been um, examples of good practice, I would say um, EU um, youth uh, dialogue. Uh, which is kind of a structured dialogue between um, um, European uh, Union institutions and young people, where um, voices of young people are taken in consideration when uh, shaping future uh, EU policies. Um, National Youth Council of Serbia has been trying to, to implement this through several of its projects. Uh, so one of the things that they have been doing, and I, I would say it is an example of uh, good practice is an uh, alternative uh, report on position of youth in Serbia, which is published every, every single year. So once we are going through the positions and opinions of young people, we are not looking at something that is maybe five or ten years old, but something that is really uh, new and relevant to, to the date. Uh, what is the purpose of this uh, report? Um, it can serve as a, a guidance and a platform to key decision ma makers uh, once they are making, making uh, policies. Also, uh, there has been a website and a platform, it's called dialogue.rs, which is, um, which is um, dedicated to uh, structured dialogue where young people can inform the ways uh, they can communicate uh, directly to decision makers and uh, to ensure their voices uh, are being heard. So this is just some of the, uh, some of the uh, examples when it comes to regional cooperation. I know uh, Dafina knows something uh, about it as well. There has been Western Balkans Youth Cooperation Platform, which uh, embodies umbrella organizations and youth national councils of the, of the Western Balkans. So they are taking it um, 
up a notch to say, and from uh, advocating and serving as a platform for young people to be engaged in decision-making processes, they are taking it on a regional level and uh, connecting people, connecting uh, narratives and helping them uh, shape their, their future and uh, to, make, to ensure their voices are being heard uh, on, a, on a regional level. So um, th th those, I would say, are examples of, those are maybe smaller steps, but they are ensuring that young people uh, participate. From my experience, uh, I would say that young people, as soon as they are given a platform or a space to, to share their opinion, to have their voice heard, they will use it. They will be really serious uh, about it and they will try not only to, to state their opinion, but to, say, uh, to state the opinion of wider, uh, wider group of, of young people. Such a thing also um, happened in Serbia recently. Um, we, the National Council um, of Serbia organized a first ever direct dialogue between uh, uh, youth, 30 young people from uh, different uh, organizations of civil society with our prime minister. And I would say it was really fruitful, maybe it was due to the upcoming elections, but our Prime Minister has been putting uh, youth uh, as a topic uh, on a top, not necessarily at the very top, but he is uh, coming close to the top of her agenda. She has been visiting uh, youth centers. So I believe usually young people are included as a part maybe of uh, consultations or they, their voice is not being heard directly, but, uh, but through um, various of channels, but when their voice is stated uh, clearly and directly, I think uh, it is uh, incredibly uh, fruitful. Uh, how does, I will not dwell too much into it because I am trying not to be too repetitive, but in my opinion, why is this uh, important for the region? Uh, these, um, these examples show that on a national level, um, you'd need space to, to state their opinions, to have their voice heard on regional as well. And usually when certain researches and reports have been done, uh, youth are questioned only on UN and um, EU, <laughs> excuse me, EU and NATO integrations, but never on regional integrations, how we want uh, this region to be shaped, what is that we can do, how do we want these things to turn out. And because, as we already said, these are our realities, and every single pitfall of our countries is directly reflected on us as young people, mm -hmm. and on our future, and on our present. So uh, I believe that um, including youth who has already been cooperating for a really long time, as Dafina has said, and these examples show that uh, youth is willing to cooperate, uh, so does the vision for 2030. Um, decision makers need to take this into consideration. They need to, to hear our voices and to shape a future of the region and uh, the cooperation of the region in the, the direction that suits our needs, because we are the the, the ones who will live longer and will have this heritage and everything that is kind of um, happening at the moment. So um, also I would like to mention um, vision of 2030. I believe all of these young people again are an example. Uh, all of us are really proud of where, where we come from, not only from our countries but also of the entire region and we have this eagerness to, to work daily, um, occasionally, whenever we have a chance together to actually shape this region in the best way possible. So uh, I think we maybe could set a good example for other young people who want to join us and also maybe to uh, motivate them to change something on their local level or national, on local level maybe uh, on regional or international, whatever their uh, ambitions are. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. It was good to hear also some uh, positive stories. Uh, and uh, to have some positive energy on the, the youth uh, inclusion and the ways how, how we can do it, how we can cooperate together and to, to empower each other in this, uh, in this area. Uh, now I'd like uh, the last uh, speaker, it's uh, Maya Bielos. Uh, she will uh, speak about the serbia kosovo relation Foreign powers, influence, gender and security, so a lot of issues yeah. <laughs> to wrap up in, in a few minutes. Thank you, Maya. Actually, I decided to provoke your thoughts, rather than uh, speaking about uh, 
uh, Kosovo Serbia relations, uh, um, but uh, I will be happy to respond any of your questions <coughs> concerning normalization of relations, mini Schengen, or any other topic that you want. Um, because um, I would like to actually talk about vision because it, it is uh, the um, it is actually the reason why we gathered here, but from very, very different angle, not from the youth angle, because I'm a security sector expert, so I will talk uh, from the security <coughs> field. And maybe um, before looking at the way ahead, I had the need actually uh, to look around and actually to see the context in which we all live and in uh, which we need to operate and uh, build um, the future. So, in a way, I will provoke you in, 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 uh, in many ways to actually think about the world that really surrounds you at the moment, which is quite challenging, not even for the states, but uh, for the younger generation to, uh, to actually to live in. What I want to say, actually, uh, to be aware that today the U.S. and China are actually the most important global powers in the current stage of transformational world order, in which multilateralism and international organizations such as UN, uh, but also EU, are losing uh, their long-held influence on the geopolitics. Uh, and increased competition that is going on across military, economy, economic and political domains actually goes hand in hand with persistent erosion of the significant aspects of the existing architecture of the international order. Um, I know that you a lot uh, spoke about like uh, we have the right on uh, to be employed, we have the right to uh, have a drinking water, to have a clean air, etc. But actually, we are living in in, uh, in the world where the US, U.S. Uh, through the UN actually attack the human rights at the moment, and we draw funding from the human rights. So we have to really struggle uh, to maintain human rights agenda if we want to see uh, the changes. Um, uh, in, a, in a short or long period of, of time because um, what is happening now with the rising conflict in the, uh, around the world where we are witnessing that many, uh, many violations of uh, human rights are happening is that like the truth is uh, out of the fashion. It's almost like human rights are out of the fashion. Uh, and something that we have to bring back to the global political agenda uh, again. Uh, then I believe uh, for you it's quite important that um, rapid technolog technological change is generating a lot of new challenges to political and societal cohesion, economic equality, national security and uh, fundamental human rights. And they have potential to enhance democratic institutions and the rule of law, but also they have potential uh, to undermine them. And really rapid uh, technology is changing um, the way how we actually see the world. And I believe there is a new Cold War between China and US on it. And um, uh, we have to, like Western Balkans, but uh, also younger generation, have to advance in this area. And I believe there is huge opportunity for the younger generation to actually step in the fourth um, uh, industrial revolution. Otherwise, we risk actually to be outdated uh, and to be overtaken by the global technology companies. So it's also the challenge that we, uh, we have to uh, th think um, uh, think uh, wh when we speak about uh, different kind of uh, policies. Um, uh, the one thing that um, uh, I've seen that uh, many young, uh, young generations want more democracy uh, today, but um, we have to 
see that we are actually confronting the right-wing uh, uh, governments that actually captured the state in the Western Balkans, um, trying to capture uh, the whole society in order to prevent any other alternatives. So it is. it will be very much challenging to actually um, uh, promote at the moment liberal political model, which is uh, quite important because the attack on the liber liberal polit political mo model, it really comes from the much bigger state than Western Balkan states are. And that is uh, also US, but many European countries uh, at the moment. And um, uh, we have uh, Western Balkans are currently uh, between the EU integration process and EU conditionality policy and growing influence of uh, foreign powers. Uh, the difference between two is actually that um, EU condition uh, their support and accession process through, through many ways, but insisted on the good governance what you care about, like provision of uh, quality public services, uh, rule of law, etc. But the, the trend I'm seeing with the growing foreign power influence and that um, many other countries that are giving foreign direct investments or invest in uh, our countries actually do not require these kind of uh, conditions. Not even Russia, China, Saudi Arabia or Turkey, they don't uh, really condition our countries to invest more uh, in rule of law, to invest more in like inclusion of uh, women, youth and others, uh, to invest, uh, I don't know, uh, more in other uh, sectors that we care, uh, care a lot. So this is uh, something we have to uh, be aware when we're trying to promote also uh, youth agenda and youth vision. When talking about vision, is actually what I see today is that uh, many politicians in the Western Balkans do not have a clear vision for their countries that is beyond, the, uh, beyond their mandate. And uh, citizens are sometimes struggling with uh, day to day or month to month uh, you know, to earn their salaries so they cannot even think uh, in a long-term perspective. Uh, we think that also uh, EU doesn't have, uh, and that is uh, through the public opinion poll in uh, my country, but also maybe in other countries, that EU doesn't have a clear vision for the Western Balkans, and I believe youth that doesn't see their perspectives in their countries, they are leaving the countries. So I believe we have, uh, uh, we are struggling with the vision of the Balkans and the vision of our own countries and there is a great potential of young people to have your say on what is the vision of your country and, uh, and the Western Balkans. But we have to, I believe, really ask ourselves and the other citizens in our countries one thing, uh, what is really strategic our um, orientation? Is it EU or we are seeking alternatives? In what kind of society do we want to live? Is it democracy or, or not? Uh, do we want to be cheap labor force or uh, we don't want to be a cheap labor force? And I believe through the demonstrations that I've seen in many countries, actually youth uh, really shape this kind of demand. Um, we talked about a lot of um, education, but what kind of education? Do we want to educate future citizens or future workers? I'm asking this question because if you, um, if you want to educate uh, future citizens, then you need a lot more civic education, you need a lot more critical thinking um, in addition to actually applied uh, knowledge and science, what actually our government something uh, wants to actually have. 
uh, more future workers that will not uh, critically think what the governments are actually doing and implementing. So this is something you have to have um, in mind. And also when implementing any kind of reforms, we have to think at the moment with what kind of resources we can implement uh, and with what kind of hu uh, human capital uh, we have currently in the country. I believe this is quite important. Uh, um, I know that many groups, especially youth, uh, do not have that much access to the public resources and I believe that's also something that should be more uh, improved uh, in the future. And thinking about this, like 2013 is quite, you know, it's a very short uh, period of time. Um, and when thinking from the perspective of EU integration, I believe the I believe that North Macedonia and Belia will get the opening uh, uh, of negotiation with the EU. But uh, thinking from now until 2013, and from the experience of Serbia, that means you have to be prepared. Uh, and prepared means that you have to have either public administration and civil society capacities to follow the European integration and to be active uh, in this process and there is a huge window of opportunity because you have a lot of different knowledges, you have uh, also, uh, I believe, language skills, um, but there is also need to, uh, in my opinion, ser seriously invest in building capacities both of public administration and civil society to actually uh, support this process. And this, it is a big task um, to actually absorb um, EU funds that will come uh, in one moment. So there is like a future in this period of time in the 10 years. And I believe there is huge opportunity for you to support your country in uh, this process. Uh, Croatia went through the process, Serbia went through the process, and Macedonia, they could be your resources or contact of points uh, so they can share your like knowledge, what they've done good and what are the lessons learned maybe not to repeat uh, again. So in terms of like the cooperation, I believe you can um, you can uh, use these kind of uh, resources and contact at the regional level. Uh, when it comes uh, to the, uh, I would like I would like to point out that. Um, I believe Western Balkans need new style of leadership. Really, seriously. Uh, the way like societies and countries are led needs to be changed. Like, um, and I know I would like to be, see different, but it's not. So I will be like frank and realistic. What you can do uh, in the next period of time, uh, our countries nurture. Uh, leaders, and they like to leaders to to lead the countries. I would like that to be different. Maybe to have more institutions that are they are like speaking on behalf of society. But leaders are quite important for our cultures and society. So what we need and what we need to invest is actually then to have. Uh, instead of the same faces we are seeing over and over again, and in my country I'm seeing the same faces from the 90s, which is scary, uh, I believe that we need to invest in new leaders, both women and men, uh, with the vision. And that can, in the Western Balkans, share the same notion of what is rule of law. Because uh, our governments and our politicians do not same share the same notion of what is uh, the rule of law. So I believe that's quite important and if we if this can be supported, I believe it's crucial to to do it. And when it comes to technology, I would like because that's the role we are actually heading to, artificial intelligence, etc. I am the analog woman, but I have to say that I'm realizing that I'm losing the game in the in this new world. So um, we have to think whether can Western Balkans have a C 
Silicon Valley or a mecca for new startups that can, uh, you know, draw attention and, and gather this kind of uh, potential in, in the region. And maybe that could be um, points for, for, for thinking. Can we actually run the global game? Or even because even EU is losing and US is losing this game uh, with, uh, with China. I guess I will. I will finish with this. Um, one thing that we are all, that we are not mentioning that rule of law it is quite important in my opinion. So uh, I believe we need to actually invest in 2000 in order to have to feel safe and secure. I believe we need independent justice, and this is quite important because I don't see that third branch of power in our countries. And I believe in order to have many other things that we want, we have to have uh, independent justice. And I want to actually have, uh, for 2030, the government, I'm a taxpayer, so I want my government to be accountable to the citizen, not to the US president, Chinese president, or anyone from the EU, but first to be to make them, to make government accountable for what they do, but to the citizens first, and to their taxpayers, which is not happening, but it's really my dream or, or wish list for the 2013. Um, because I believe that's quite important. And from the base, from, uh, I must be like honest and frank, uh, based on Serbian experience, like, once you open the EU negotiation process, um, many things can, like, uh, can uh, have its own either opportunities or, like, downsides. One of the things is that um, executive power even becomes more stronger in the process because the government is actually leading the process. So you have to have, you have to really be behind the back of your governments in order to see the process. Because many pro these kind of processes are mostly not transparent that much. And sometimes they're behind the closed door and we don't know what the government is actually negotiating and what is the final price we will, uh, we will pay. So in this kind of uh, process, you have to ensure um, you know, you have to push for more transparency, and you have to uh, really know how to. The government has a responsibility to explain to the citizens what is the EU, what are the like processes, but you can also have help to explain citizens why the EU integration accession process is important. Because if you fail to do it, the next thing what will what can happen is that the support for the EU accession process will drop significantly. So I believe you have very good skills of communication and communicating with your generation or maybe across the generation. And I believe there is also a window of opportunity for uh, this kind of uh, role in a very close, uh, in a very close future. So I will stop here. I have some other things to say. But leave it to you to actually pose me questions. Thank you, Maya. It was uh, interesting and there were a lot of uh, issues discussed here which might uh, open the debate now for feedback and also uh, questions from you. Uh, we had the uh, different presentation on different topics, so I think that uh, uh, any comment or question or suggestion that you might have for the, this vision of the future would be uh, easily fit in this uh, in this idea, in this event that we, we are having. So now the floor is yours, please. Who is going to be the first? 
Thank you for, for your question. Um, I will be, like, this is my opinion, and I will be completely frank. Um, I would like to have, uh, I would like to actually see the more genuine wish and will uh, for both leaders to, like, leaders in Pristina and Kosovo to cooperate more and to have really frank, but it, this is not happening. It, it is possible because you uh, US, US press, press the button. And in a few meetings, Grenell managed to actually do it. So, um, uh, where I see this as a failure of EU, uh, and EU officials to be more involved, which um, I, I believe the citizens and many others ask for more EU involvement in this. But at the end, we end up with the US um, going through the region and making agreements with our politicians. So that was it. That was the one thing. Um, whether this is very profitable or not, I don't believe so, because like uh, regional flights are expensive for the citizens, ordinary. So if you want to travel to Podgorica, for example, it's a uh, long time ago it was 110 euros. Uh, now it's m even more. So it's not profitable flight. Uh, it will not fly Air Serbia, for example. It will fly Lufthansa. So the agreement was also made and approved by the Germany as well. And it will not really go directly to Pristina, but go a little bit to Macedonia and then turn to Pristina in order to land. So uh, I believe that uh, the price of the ticket would be at least 100 20 or even more. Um, that's not really uh, in terms of profitable because nowadays people can connect more as well. Um, a return ticket for Pristina is 25 euros, for example, and you have very good daily buses that run, I don't know, several times per day if you want to go to the north Kosovo or, or to Pristina. So, and people from actually uh, Kosovo coming more and more to Belgrade, which I, I, I think is very much positive. And there is people, more and more people to people connection also in terms of uh, cooperation between uh, chambers of commerce that is going on. It's very vivid and, and active. It's, uh, it is not translated to citizens through media because citizens in, in media are quite polarized and do not see that uh, dynamics on the ground. So that is problem. For me, it's really, if the air company should be profitable, what is the profit if you raise that kind of prices for the citizens that, you know, what is the salary of ordinary citizens in, in um, Kosovo? So if the ticket is the half of their salaries, who will then fly from Pristina to Belgrade and like vice versa? So it has to go with a lot of money. Uh, and we have so many issues to resolve before, uh, before the flight even starts. It's the same thing with the railway. It's thanks to the Americans. But if we are waiting constantly for Americans to jump in, in order for, for us to improve the quality of citizen's life and make connections, then this is not, for me, a uh, good signal. Because there is demand between people to actually work together and cooperate. Thanks.
Hello, I am Armino. I studied for justice in the University of Tirana. And my question goes for Stephanie and Tapino, uh, North Macedonia and Albania, two countries that are looking for the key to open an investigation in the uh, European Union. And uh, I was reading uh, the text, and it's uh, really good uh, work, uh, good evaluation. Uh, I was uh, reading, uh, in fact, uh, the World Bank, as in the World Bank report, that the states uh, that North Macedonia in uh, already 5,100 uh, people have left, most of them young and well educated. The same thing is happening in Albania too. So uh, my question is, uh, what is uh, measures uh, that uh, should be taken to to stop this phenomenon? Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's also one of the things we usually cover, but today we kind of skipped it. So when we talk about uh, brain drain and young people moving abroad, it's not always only the education um, challenges that I've already mentioned, but it's also plenty of other things that affect their quality of life. Mm -hmm. So um, that's also the political cu culture that exists within the country. That's also the effectiveness of the um, institutions they come to contact with. Uh, that's also the the health uh, the health system they're they're being offered. So the, the that part of their lives, and it's also better working opportunities for higher higher salaries. That um, that number five hundred thousand uh, people who who left, out of which uh, most of them are highly educated and um, work uh, like they represent a workforce from the country. They are living definitely because of the uh, because of the better salaries. So, if you ask me, what are the first measures that the country should take? Um, there's another problem which is related <coughs> to this, but it's um, it has their, its origins in the educational system, and that's getting to know uh, the labor market. So, uh, within the, those 12 years and plus more or less four to five years um, university studies, rarely when the young people have a chance to uh, get to know the labor market. So they don't know where to look for a job, they have, um, they actually they don't have many contacts in the, in the business sector, um, they don't follow the, the calls for, for working places and that's one aspect. Of course, those who follow and who find their working places are dissatisfied with the treatment they get and the salaries. So there are two things we need to treat at the same time. One is to make sure that they know the labor market and they also know their, their rights as a future worker. So that's why when Maya was speaking earlier about the, are we going to educate citizens or, or workers, I think we need to be prepared for both. So if we educate workers, we have to make sure that those workers know their rights and no one is going to mistreat them once when they're in their working place. So we have to make sure that young people have the needed experience to, to get um, to, to fit in the labor market, know how to fit in the labor market and are familiar, familiarized with the labor market. And the other thing is that we need to make sure that um, young quality well, people who have um, already education, experience, and are and are really of good quality. We need to make sure that we are paying them enough as another country would be paying them, especially for the sectors that are making the same amount of money in the in the countries across Europe and in um, in North Macedonia. Thank you. So thank you for thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> good. Um, for, in my opinion, not to be too long, there are two, uh, two ways how to treat the situation. Because all, all the reforms and all the efforts being put by the governments and other stakeholders and, and internationals are with the idea to keep the human capital within this region and to invest in the young generations. But meanwhile that we are talking, people are leaving. So this is your, this is your point. And, it, and they are well educated. This is what hurts which in our way and path towards EU integration, for us it will be a huge cost not having those minds and those people in our country when we are going through very important reforms and transformations. 
In my opinion, the first thing that should be done, and it's not done till now, and I think that it's something which we have been as well too quiet about, is that the migration of young people during these years in Albania, 34 or 5, has not been treated as an emergency and as a national priority, which needs an immediate national action plan how to make sure that young people are not leaving anymore to work systematically in different sectors. And the other thing, the other solution or the other way how to treat the issue is the circulating migrants. What are the proper strategies and action plan being undertaken by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other ministries in line to uh, push forward this issue, to be connected with diaspora and try to attract the people, the young people back. So. I don't want, I'm not an expert on migrants, but I've been working in several projects tackling the issue. The, the latest one was with the Swiss embassy, which consisted on a new narrative about migration. Because I think the, 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 the thing that we can do, at, coming from the civil society perspective, is to try to shape a new narrative about migrants, bringing a positive approach and trying to make young people uh, more uh, aware and and and. and critical on the way how, how they leave their, com their countries to go back for, for, for a better life and for better conditions. There is something that we cannot influence to because it's their personal decision. But seeing from a political perspective, we all do have a responsibility in this. So in my point of view, there should be much more efforts being put by the government and by, by the decision makers and politicians. And, 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 and the parliament as well, to make some crucial changes and treating the issue as a national priority. Um, I would have as well two very short comments, but uh, after uh, all the questions are, are as rated, so I'm not continuing with okay. that. Yeah. I want to add, even though the question was not addressed to me. I would like that. Uh, yeah. <coughs> We have to have very serious debate in our countries, how actually austerity measures for the citizens and many privileges to the companies and financial institutions in our country actually led to, to or open the way to a uh, rise of populist and right-wing governments that are actually dismantling social welfare system and conducting very controversial privatization in our countries. Um, so one of my things I would like to see that the government either removes that austerity measures for uh, citizens and impose more justice tax in the society and especially to the companies. That's the one thing. It's very tricky if you want to be like well-educated person that will uh, uh, tell a woman worker who works in a Chinese com firm or factory in Serbia wearing diapers because she cannot go have a break, that she needs to know her rights and she has to stand for the rights. It's very tricky and it's very risky uh, at the moment. So we have to, you know, find different ways in order to actually ta tackle this. What is dismantled in our country is what was very good tradition from the socialist period time, I'm talking about for me, Flavia, is that unions. Unions don't, if, if there are unions in your countries, there are unions in Serbia, but they don't stand too much uh, for the workers' rights or for the young generation that has to enter the, the labor market. So if we want to do something, we have to also have unions and we have to also work uh, again on this, on this area uh, as well. So in my, in my opinion, but maybe there are also, there are so many plenty of other mm -hmm. like options what, what we can do, but I see that uh, we forgot about this, uh, this element as well. Mm -hmm. So you should think about how to make actually this these mechanisms, they're quite important for, for you. And um, I see that governments are constantly se sending the message to, to the youth. We don't want to employ you, but we, do, uh, we will support you to start your own jobs. Yeah. 
to be entrepreneurs, to actually develop startups, etc. So this is one of the things rhetoric should be like changed in mm -hmm. a way. Uh, I will add something also, I know this question again has not been addressed to me, but we have tackled um, employment and education. I think one of the, which um, the, the, the report uh, about the Serbia I was mentioning, I think it also is represented in this vision, um, is also uh, gaining independence. So young people, just because uh, either they lack um, uh, education or they lack employment, they uh, only at certain age, which I would say it's quite late comparing to, to our peers from European Union, gain, gain independence, not only financial, but their own living space where they can live because it's not really easy for a young person to, to even a rent apartment or yet alone buy one. So I would say that sometimes people do leave their country because not only they will get um, better employment, better um, better. Um, Circumstances to to uh, work in, but also they will get uh, they will stand a chance of gaining that sort of uh, employment, and that's again why it's important to include youth in in such issues and in shaping policies because sometimes people who are making these policies are already have their uh, their houses, apartments, have kids, and they don't even think in in uh, such a direction. So I think one of the issues is also when young people gain their independence, and when it comes to um, uh, employment. I would think um, I would also mention self-employment. How does how do our governments treat uh, startups, new businesses in Serbia? When you start a startup, you even if you have zero income for the month, you already own um, to your country between 200 to 300 euros in taxes. What are the benefits? What are the changes in our tax system that can be? Um, how our countries can contribute through tax system to empowering of young people not only to find employment but also to start their own businesses. So I think like these questions are so much wider. But I think like I know these uh, uh, these things are important in Serbia, and I I, I believe they're also uh, important in regions. So when we speak about employment education, there is also so much to it that uh, and so many issues that can be tackled in in order to to keep uh, the, the the youth the not only high qualified youth, but all the youth should remain in, in their countries if they feel like they don't um, have to have a need to live just for a better life. So I believe th those issues could be tackled as well. Thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting because uh, it is not just uh, when we, we speak about participation in decision-making processes and uh, it's not this ra only these round tables which are relevant to, to youth, but it also like it issues that you mentioned, taxation, that to be hard related uh, things that directly affect them. And it's, it is important to, to be uh, together around these issues and to tackle that in, in a more organized way, because you know, in front you have uh, uh, the government ministries uh, that can uh, suffocate you with technicalities, and uh, it is it is very important to, to be well prepared and, and focus on these issues. Uh, other questions? Uh, yes, Ms. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we always speak about the region and regional cooperation. But uh, is it the region in the minds of the citizens, for example, in education, in, in history education, is it presented in the region or is it not presented as uh, one fight against the other? Mm -hmm. So in particular, as Oronen, but also the others, how they see uh, the teaching of history. And uh, of course, when there's a sort of conflict, it's particularly uh, difficult. And I think Oronen was a uh, planning a uh, museum, perhaps you can say some words about it, but also the other topics, because that I think is also very important that the young people get some image that is also a region in spite of conflicts, uh, in spite of wars in the past, but not, but that would give my question to you, how you, how you perceive history taught in the schools and it is helping to have regional cooperation or is still preventing the, that kind of understanding. Um, so it's, it's okay. No. Okay. No. 
um, sorry. history textbooks in Kosovo are very biased. And by biased, I mean um, we have phrases such as Lufta heroike perjakshme Kosovas, Barbaret serb erlanga malet kudiumsho. But what we have, um, I'll try to, to translate that in English. We have um, a lot of rhetoric, we have a lot of folklorism, and we have very little actual facts. And we're teaching that to our little kids in schools. Of course, they're going to grow up hating each other. They're going to grow up thinking that we are where we are because we've always been the victim. And it is time that we actually, that we, we have qualified history textbook professionals who will treat history right, who will present both sides. And of course, I'm, I'm not saying that we should not present the crimes that the other party has committed. However, we need to be very careful what language we are using, even when we do so. And we need to be careful uh, with the facts and with everything. Because in our history textbooks, for instance, uh, we don't learn about the crimes that uh, both Kosovo or Serbia have committed towards the minorities, mm -hmm. like against Roma, Chikali, and Egyptians. We never talk about that. And um, we have to. And um, then also, uh, that's one thing, how we learn history in our elementary and high schools. The other thing is that even within Kosovo itself, um, Serbian kids learn different history from different textbooks, and Kosovo, uh, Albanian kids learn a different history. And let alone when we think about how um, children in Serbia or in Macedonia are learning history in their respective countries. So we are living in the Balkans. We've all experienced like the 90s, after the war, and everything that has happened. And now we are teaching the version that we think looks better, makes us, makes us look better, um, stronger, smarter, and the victim. Because we always portray ourselves as victims in our textbooks. Um, so we need to work on that. Uh, there have been a few initiatives. Uh, alternative textbooks have been introduced, but not many people know about it. They're not being used. They're currently being translated, if, not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, there's a lot of controversy and debate going on in Pristina regarding history textbooks. Uh, the NGO I work for, um, the executive director, has uh, um, published uh, a few research papers internationally when it comes to um, history textbooks in school that are, um, that are drafted and uh, published by well-known Albanian experts, but who actually misrepresent and that we totally disagree the way that history is presented in the textbooks. So there's a lot that needs to be done. And um, personally, I believe that uh, the education system should be priority number one, although I understand and I'm well aware that we won't be able to see the consequences, but we will need time. But we need to start working on the education sector ASAP so that in 20, 30 years' time, we can, we can see some of the results. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, we have, to start, we have to work on the judiciary and all other aspects, employment and so on. But we cannot expect, to, we cannot expect a, a prospective integration into the EU whenever that happens, be that in 20 years' time. Uh, if we don't have well-educated people to uh, be in charge to draft proper textbooks or to, to, to make proper laws, and then uh, the question is, what are we bringing to the table? What are we going to bring to the EU? We also need to think about that because we're always complaining uh, the Western Balkans that we're the victim that the EU does not want us, but we also need to think about doing our own homework. Uh, because, uh, yeah, Maya mentioned several times that the, the states comes here, right, and um, runs through the countries, makes some deals with the politicians, and that's it. Well, yeah, that's true, because perhaps we have failed to do so ourselves. We cannot sit at a table and talk. I mean, you and I, obviously we can, but our politicians. And then the majority of the population are the victim of those nationalistic rhetorics. Vucic, Hashintachi, Rama... Haradinai. And I think it's very important that the youngsters take charge uh, and get involved in politics so that we can gradually change and switch this, this, this whole discourse and the way we perceive the, 
the current situation and the future. Alona gave a very good um, description of how the situation is actually and uh, I also agree and must say that to bring a certain change in the curricula or in the classic educational system it takes a, long, a lot of time and a lot of commitment from the Ministry of Education but not only, it's also the Academy of Science, there are uh, academians which have been working on the field and I think there is a need for some exchange projects among them so they would sit and, and discuss and see for alternative solutions. Uh, the alternative textbooks that Aulona mentioned uh, is also from the experience of um, Polish-German uh, reconciliation and Franco-German reconciliation as well. We had the opportunity to be part of um, uh, some very good experiences and activities when, where they explained us how the first steps were put towards this direction. They worked on some alternative textbooks and then uh, introduced it to the institutions which were in charge uh, for education to give these textbooks as an alternative curricula for those students and pupils who want to learn about. And this is a very good first step because you give an opportunity. You do not make it part of the classical educational system, but you give an opportunity to young people to choose. And then it's a process and a lot of exchanges and a lot of projects were put among uh, academians and people coming from, uh, from the universities and, and, and from the Ministry of Education. And the important thing is to start, uh, to start this rhetoric. And the other thing which I would like very much to mention here is that in the region we still uh, lack capacities of, um, of well-educated um, educators or uh, those professionals with proper pedagogical skills which will make uh, the intercultural exchange projects or activities function by enabling the detachment of the emotions from facts. And this is a sector which needs a lot of investment. If it's fine, sorry, I hold this topic really close to my heart. Uh, so when it comes to, to the history books, I always like to, especially when I talk to my Albanian friends, to say, uh, especially the from Kosovo, that we have this um, a coin, which is history, and two sides to it. So we have different two uh, interpretations of the of the same history, and we like the 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 shared narrative and I do agree about even some folklore, some myths, some more recent even I think that it is what prevents um, reconciliation for um, taking more active approach uh, because we lack this common ground um, so often. So um, I also wanted to, I feel like I'm giving the, the, the good um, examples. Uh, I really want to, to share with you, there has it has been done uh, by the end of um, last year some um, at the end of the year um, there has been this booklet my maybe you know about it uh, it's called when Serbs and Albanians loved each other it was first done in Serbian language then uh, translated uh, into English and I know, I believe it's now been translated to Albanian language and it has been distributed in Serbia with uh, daily newspapers so um, if you're willing so there's a kind of smaller steps, I believe, and which I'm really happy about that are taking place towards uh, creating this shared narrative and actually pointing out situations when we were cooperating rather than we uh, had our backs uh, turned to each other. So. Do we have more questions or comments? Yes. Two. <coughs> Uh, hi everyone, my name is Vixen Bloshin, I study political science at the University of Tirana, Faculty of Social Science. And uh, I believe there is an aggressive environment, an aggressive in the air between some uh, Western Balkan countries. Uh, and I want to mention some moments why I believe so. The first is the fact that uh, Serbia has voted against uh, Kosovo. Uh, entrance and accession in uh, Interpol organization. The second might be the the denial of several several times the denied the some uh, massacre of uh, Kosovo uh, uh, people, and uh, we've got an ongoing 100% uh, tax from Kosovo upon uh, Serbia. 
Uh, I believe that this is an aggressive environment between these two countries, and uh, I want to know how uh, we as youth can collaborate in such aggressive environment when our big politicians are not, uh, well, let's say, we, they are fighting. How can we cooperate in such environment? And uh, according to the lady already said uh, that uh, last year in Serbia it was published a book about how Albanians and Serbians loved each other. Uh, I want to know, is this contradictory to the moment when President Vucic says that there is no, uh, there is no massacre, massacres in Kosovo? Okay. Um. Uh, everyone can answer this question, but I want to know what uh, Dr. Yan's uh, can we answer this question. Can we also take another, another question and then... Okay, hopefully I will Thank you, because my question or my reflection is totally fitted to, uh, to, your, uh, to your question. Well, I'm, uh, my name is Ines, I'm from academia, and I'm working on my research project on transitional justice. So, I think that when I, I, I was really amazed when I saw the International Institute for Peace is part of this, because when we are going to think about Western Balkans, we must uh, start thinking about peaceful means of transforming our societies, but we haven't talked yet. But I think that at the end of this meeting we have opened such such a debate because it's not a heavy issue or a topic on uh, young shoulders to talk only about employment and migration, but a heavy topic is to deal with the past. And it's our uh, shared past. It's our common ground to talk about reconciliation, our truth, our Balkan societies. Um, because European Union uh, started as a peaceful project, something to bring peace into uh, the European countries. Maybe is it time to talk about a uh, European or something like a peaceful regional approach of Western Balkans in order to enhance with other steps, um, step by step, but also providing some uh, transitional and to talk more about our truth, justice, and common grounds. This is how I see youth in in uh, in this decade talking about our common narratives and transform those narratives. I was reading yesterday. I started to read yesterday a book about um, uh, rational dictators. About the rational dictators. Are we having rational dictators as decision makers? This is what young people should talk about. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Should I start? Thank you for the question. Um, and believe me when I say that in every tour, activity, or meeting with young people that we have been doing during these years by representing the regional cooperation momentum among young people, there have been similar questions made. And this is a true concern. And it's absolutely a right, true concern. If we see the highest decision-making uh, sphere or highest decision-making, the decision-makers behaving in a way and in the same time supporting projects on the ground which do promote reconciliation, you are confused as a citizen, as a young people, and this is quite normal. But what is important, um, it's to be clear and to be, um, to be honest on what we are talking about. I do not take responsibility for uh, my Prime Minister's speech. I take responsibility for, for the vote that I have given. So the biggest fear in all this discourse is that are we living in a double standard society which really wants democratization and peace building and in the other hand is reflecting its political will in a completely another way, image, or dimension by voting in a very closed um, system without no choice. Are the leaders who are leading today a reflection of a very open, open system and a reflection of the willingness or, or a reflection of whom we really want to see in those positions? So unlocking the electoral system, unlocking the democratic system, it's a first step for the citizens to choose and to vote those leaders and those people which are leading the country. And then, maybe, in that moment, what they say and how they behave, it's our responsibility. But for now, 
I can't be sure. On the other hand, can these two realities, different ones, coexist? Yes, they can, because they are coexisting. We have been working for several years with colleagues from Serbia, North Macedonia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo. We have managed to create very good consortiums, very good examples, very good activities. We have known each other, we have developed. We are now in another momentum. We are walking on that path. Are incidents happening on the same time? Yes, they are. So this is not an utopia, this is our reality. Now the idea, and I was provoked by Maya's, uh, by Maya's uh, speech or uh, explanations, is that we should question ourselves that do we want to see in the highest decision-making processes the reflection of us, or are we reflecting the, the, the attitude of our leaders? And this is something we need to think about and to solve it immediately, so we do not have confusions anymore. So I don't know if it was the, the, the answer you expected, but this is, this is the answer I can give. Okay, I will uh, also answer uh, your questions. I, yeah, uh, what you said about taking responsibility. Do I take responsibility for what has been said on uh, our political representatives? No. Do I support them by voting for them? No. Um, when it comes to uh, the things that can be changed, this is why it's important to have youth included because we do um, we do our uh, live our uh, own realities, and I, I would say they're quite different from political uh, realities we see see in the Western Balkans because we do uh, cooperate. I personally travel a lot to to Kosovo. I have Kosovo friends. Some of them are really my, one of my closest friends, and we can come on on good terms and actually work together. Uh, when it comes to um, how to stay, well, the, the, the stay, sayings of our of our politicians. Um, I don't think those people are really even accountable for their own <laughs> words because they have been saying some things 20 years back, saying having different narratives, and they they use um, use them as they as they wish, and that is again something that is reflective um, of uh, of our reality. Uh, also, when it comes to um, young people, I think to go back to education and uh, what Alone and Stephanie both uh, said, um, I think. Um, our education, our history shapes our realities. And again, with the, the two, two sides of the same coin, you would have, um, we are raised with certain beliefs, especially when it comes to, to Kosovo. You, you grow up learning these things, which uh, at the end you end up inheriting, they uh, interiorizing them. And trust me, it takes so much effort to break out of these narratives. It takes so much effort, uh, takes so much education, being formal, informal, takes so much uh, energy uh, leaving your surrounding, uh, meeting the other side, as would, I would say. And it's not always a pleasant, I speak from my personal experience, because I would be overlooked why do, why do I want to work with people from, from Kosovo. And when I go to Kosovo, I usually had wonderful experience, and I really love going there, but sometimes people will get weirded out why am I there why must uh, she's a Serb why is she she even there even when um, all the events are the, of the similar nature of youth cooperation so I think so much burden is put upon us as young people and I think we do demand more space to um, get our voice heard but there are some things that um, youth on its own can't uh, deal with and I believe like economy some deeper structural problems and I think reconciliation is a deeper structural problem and our political leaders um, they have to take greater responsibility for it and as Maya has mentioned we do need change because the same people have been uh, in, in charge have been involved into politics and shaping our realities our narratives um, since the 90s and we know th those were not the, the, the golden times for the Balkans so we as young people People do try to, to, to raise awareness. Um, many of my friends from, from Serbia, seeing my example, are willing to travel to Kosovo, kind of maybe change um, their opinions, maybe break out of these narratives of uh, what Kosovo represents to Serbia and how it is uh, perceived. So those are maybe micro steps, but um, kind of with joint efforts, I think it could be translated into, into the political speeches as well. I hope it this um, answers your question. Thank you.
we have more questions or comments? Okay, uh, I would like to... Uh, okay. Yes.
If uh, we don't have, if we don't have uh, any more comments or suggestions, I would like to thank all the panelists, and of course Mr. Svoboda again, and all your participation and the debate that uh, we hope to, of course, to follow up in uh, other activities in uh, here in Tirana or in other cities around uh, the Western Balkans, and to continue this debate and to continue our work in empowering the youth and uh, having a, a meaningful uh, intervention and, and lobbying uh, and uh, pushing uh, to all these issues which are very relevant not uh, only for the youth but for the whole economic and social development of, of our country and our region. Thank you. Okay.